On the beaches of Peru, a fisherman goes out on his boat and throws his net. Suddenly, the net is pulled down by something in the water and the man falls along. He decides to swim down to retrieve the net, which is stuck on a bunch of rocks. However, a huge swarm of fish begins to surround him and then kill him. In Scotland, biologist Charlie is on a research mission sent by the Institute of Marine Biology in Germany. Her co-worker Rahim sends her instructions to map a specific section of the seabed using oves, which are autonomous underwater vehicles. At that moment, Charlie sees an alarm on the computer and discovers that one of the oves has stopped working, so she goes out on a boat to check on it. It turns out the ove is stuck in the chains of a buoy, thus Charlie dives underwater to untangle it. As she works, she can't help sensing something strange surrounding her, but she can't see anything. Nervous, she finishes the untangling quickly and resurfaces, only to discover her boat has drifted away from her. Charlie swims as fast as possible and gets back to it just in time. Sometime later, Charlie receives co-workers Jess and Thomas, who will help her get the ove operational again. Thomas is surprised to find burned parts inside, but Charlie swears that she doesn't know how it happened. The duo leaves as soon as the repairs are done and now Charlie feels very lonely, so she goes to a pub where she meets fisherman Douglas and they end up spending the night together. The next morning, Charlie takes Douglas with her to launch the repaired ove. It goes well, but before they leave, Douglas notices something weird floating in the water. Charlie grabs it and sets it on fire as she explains it's methane hydrate, which is released by algae and then freezes. Sometimes a few pieces break free and float to the surface, however there are tons of them surrounding them now, which isn't normal. Charlie records it all and later sends it to the institute for Professor Lehman and her other co-workers to analyze. Lehman asks Charlie to investigate if this is happening anywhere else in the area. Meanwhile in Canada, Leon and a co-worker of the Vancouver Marine Institute discover a dead orca at the beach with strange bruises on its body that could only be made by humans. Calculating the direction it came from, the duo visits the local fisherman at the cove and learns that the orca attacked their boat, which isn't normal behavior. The fishermen had no choice but to fight back to save their own lives. Later, Leon keeps an eye on the whale tracker and worries because the migrating whales haven't shown up at the usual time, which never happens. This is also causing trouble for local tourism since many people come by just to hire boat rides and watch the whales. Leon's girlfriend Lizzie runs a small boat and worries she may have to sell it if the whales don't arrive soon. The following day, Leon gets very excited when he hears signals indicating the whales have finally shown up. He calls Lizzie to let her know and is surprised to hear that all of them have come at the same time all over the coast. While Lizzie takes some tourists out on her boat including reporter Alicia, Leon heads out to do his research and is startled when a whale surfaces just to stare at him for a moment before leaving. Then Leo discovers multiple orcas advancing toward Lizzie's boat at a great speed, so he immediately goes after them to check what's happening. At that moment, a whale begins performing a few flips for the tourists, only to suddenly land directly on the boat and break it in two. People fall into the water and the orcas arrive to start feeding on them. Leon calls for help before bringing as many people as possible into his boat. Alicia manages to get aboard but Lizzie goes back to save a child. She pushes the little girl onto the boat safely, however before she can jump in as well, an orca eats her. Meanwhile in a restaurant in France, a chef is getting the lobsters ready for cooking. He suddenly notices one of them is exuding a weird white liquid and the lobster even squirts it in his face. Furious, the chef makes two employees take care of it and the lobster ends up in the garbage disposal. Soon the chef begins to feel unwell and goes outside for fresh air, only to collapse to the ground. Sometime later, one of the employees is sent to the hospital because of fever, black vomit, and diarrhea. Dr. Sophia and Cecile hear about the chef's death, who was found with the same black vomit, and request permission for an autopsy. Cecile worries that this may be something contagious going around the restaurant staff so she goes to talk to one of the cooks and learns about the lobster incident. Afterward she goes to check on the other cook that handled the lobster, who has missed work today. Unfortunately by the time Cecile makes it to the cook's apartment, she's already dead. At that same time in the hospital, the first cook goes through a cardiac arrest and Sophia with her team try to save him, but sadly he doesn't make it. In the meantime, Leon is trying to deal with his grief when he meets an astrophysicist called Samantha, who compares the sea to space and gives him her card in case he ever needs someone to talk to. Then Leon visits the port offices and is shocked to learn that humpback whales have been attacking ships all over the area. Usually they're only aggressive to protect their babies, but it's not mating season and only big whales have been seen around. Leon also notices that the ships are covered with way more muscles than normal, so he takes a few for his research. In the Norwegian Sea, Professor Sigur is brought to a charter ship hired by Havistad Energy, where he meets with his old friends Captain Jasper and Tina, who works as Havistad's compliance officer. They show him footage of the area where Havistad is looking for gas and oil, which has been covered with ice worms feeding with frozen methane. They're multiplying at an alarming speed, but when their camera tries to get closer, a strange interference interrupts the recording. Afterward Sigur gets to study one of these worms up close and notices they have different claws from usual, they're bigger, and their reproduction is happening faster as well. He tells Tina this must be a new species and that she should consult an expert in the field, but Tina refuses because she wants to work with him. 
At first Sigur refuses because the two of them have a past and because he doesn't like Hovestad's shady practices against the environment. But Tina says she'll let him sign all the reports to avoid hiding information and he accepts. Later, Sigur and Tina bring their discovery to Lehman's lab and she agrees it must be a new species. The really disturbing part is that these worms are going through the ice on the sea floor even though there isn't anything for them to feed on as if they were self-destructing. Tina must report this to Havistad and Rahim gets annoyed that a company gets a say before they can release new discoveries to the world. Afterwards Sigur and Tina have a meeting with members of Havistad, who want to know how to solve this quickly so they can keep on digging. Tina convinces they need more samples before they can make a decision, so the board approves another trip. On their way out, Sigur offers Tina to take her home, but he's disappointed to see her boyfriend is already there for her. During their second exploration, the camera reveals that the worms have gotten even bigger. As a test, they activate the ship's drill, but it immediately begins malfunctioning. Suddenly the ship starts shaking and swaying before something explodes underwater. Sometime later, they bring this issue to Lehman again, and she explains that the drill released the trapped methane and caused the explosion. If the ship had been smaller, it would have been destroyed. From what they can see on the scans, the bacteria mat is also eating its way through the ice, and if they reach the bottom of the seabed it'll be disastrous for marine life. Since this is getting serious, Tina invites Sigur to come with her to an energy council meeting to find out if other scientists have also seen the worms. Back to Charlie, she's doing some work at the pub and sends Jess a birthday message before taking a break with Douglas. Jess is currently with Thomas working on another expedition in a boat, and when Jess sees Charlie's message, she starts recording a video for her. Suddenly the computers start to malfunction and weird readings appear on the screens. The ship begins to shake as the sea underneath takes a weird consistency and swallows it down, killing Thomas and Jess. While Rahim and Charlie are devastated to hear the bad news, weird things continue to happen in the sea. In Venice, the locals are shocked to discover that the waters are suddenly full of jellyfish. Meanwhile Leo shows the muscle samples to Alicia and other scientists at the Vancouver Institute, who are shocked to see the results. These muscles are much bigger than usual and their rate of reproduction is too fast, so they could be a new species or a mutation. They also notice a white substance coming out of them, so they'll have to test it too. Then Leo asks for permission to do an autopsy on the dead orca because even if it died from its wounds, its weird behavior needs an explanation. There are no signs of infection and nothing weird in its stomach, however Leon is shocked to find a strange white clot in the dead orca's brain stem. They think it's most likely a fungus, but they'll have to run even more tests to confirm it. Later while they analyze the pattern of the whale's attacks and other anomalies, Leon recognizes that they've all happened in the migration path of the whales. Wanting answers, Leon takes a boat with his co-worker and Alicia to the middle of the ocean, where he dives in and finds the pot of whales he tracks sleeping. Very carefully, he manages to place a camera on one of their backs, but suddenly they wake up and start acting strangely. Leon swims quickly and returns to the boat, which leaves right before the whales hit it. Sometime later, Leon is alerted that the camera has come off the whale, so he rushes to retrieve it from the ocean. In France, Cécile runs some tests on the blood from the three cooks and even double checks with her own blood. She reports to Sophia that it's a bacterium called Vibrio vulnificus, which produces toxins when it comes into contact with blood and causes infections. However these infections are very rarely fatal, and what these three people had is a new mutation that actually consumes the person's blood at an alarming rate. Sophia informs her she's heard of more deaths with the same symptoms in a restaurant up at the coast, so it's spreading. In a car wash nearby, an employee starts feeling dizzy as a client yells at him, only to suddenly throw up black vomit and collapse. He's immediately taken to the hospital, where Sophia notices that there are two more cases like this coming. She discusses theories with Cecile, who discards that the infection may be airborne because they'd have even more sick people. Then it hits her, the infection must be in the water system because the lobster was thrown in the garbage disposal. While a special team closes up the car wash and takes water samples, Cecile sends her children to stay with her ex-husband and reminds them not to drink tap water. Meanwhile Sigur travels to Switzerland to meet with Sato, a representative of Mifune Industries. Sigur knows they're losing ships to the recent trouble in the oceans and gives them an envelope with his findings about the worms. Later Sato takes this information to the company owner Mifune, revealing they already knew about the worms. Mifune orders his employees to find out where Sigur's loyalties lay since Havistad is the competition. In the evening, Sigur meets with Tina and demands to know if she truly only wanted to see him for work. Tina admits that she missed him and they end up spending the night together. The next day, Sato calls Sigur and shares his own information, they've found the same worms in China, Japan, and India. Sato also implies that Havistad doesn't have an exploration license and that Tina lied to him. Seconds later, Sigur receives a video from Sato that shows Havistad's practices are harmful to nature. Sigur calls Tina to tell her about the worms in the other areas but doesn't mention the video. Their conversation ends abruptly because Tina is currently with her boyfriend, who doesn't know she cheated on him. In Germany, Charlie returns to the institute because she wants to watch the footage of the search for Jess and Thomas sunk ship with Rahim and Lehman. The bodies haven't been found yet, but the camera shows a mysterious white substance floating around the ship which defies explanation. 
At the same time in Canada, Leon and his co-workers watch the footage from the whale camera, noticing the whales are diving deeper than usual. In the end they find the same white substance surrounding the whales and a strange sound that doesn't sound anything like a whale song. In the meantime in South Africa, a couple is having a nice moment on the beach when suddenly the girl is pinched by a crab. They turn around and notice an insane amount of crabs emerging from the sea and invading the city. The couple tries to escape on a bike, only to end up falling on the streets as the crabs surround them. In France, Sophia and Cecile explain their discovery to the government, but they don't have a cure for it yet. They ask for all fishing to be stopped and for water systems to be shut down, but the government doesn't want to do it because of the potential economic consequences. Later, Cecile watches the news and learns that the same crab invasion is now also happening in Brazil, Japan, India, and Morocco. Back to Sigur, he and Tina board Jasper's ship again to find out the spread of the ice worms. The screen reveals there's absolutely no life in the area, and Jasper confirms that Hovestad's ships have been around here the last few weeks. Sigur tells Tina that Hovestad has lied to her and in the guise of laying pipes they have breached the terms of their permit. Tina is hurt that he knew about this and didn't tell her sooner, showing a lack of trust in her. Sadly Sigur admits he indeed doesn't trust her because of the troublesome history they share, so an argument ensues until Tina walks off. Later when Sigur tells Lehman what happened, the professor says it's very possible that Tina didn't know. She also advises Sigur not to leak the story, because Hovestad will just blame it all on Tina. In Canada, the Institute learns that their weird muscles have also been found in Madagascar, Uganda, and Paraguay. To their shock, they all have the same genetic barcode as theirs, which should be impossible. They suspect the white substance found in the whale's brain is the same that the muscle was leaking the other day, but sadly it decomposed as soon as it touched air, so Leon will have to get another sample. Leon returns to the port offices but this time he isn't allowed in because it's become a restricted area. He pretends to leave, only to return seconds later to jump over the fence. Unfortunately he isn't sneaky enough and soon the guards are chasing after him until they arrest him. However the port's boss gives Leon a chance and makes him talk to Sato, who quickly worries when he hears everything the institute has discovered. Sometime later, Alicia points out that they should check with other organizations to see if they've heard the sound they noticed in the whale recording before, so Leon tells her to contact Samantha. In France, a bunch of boxes labeled biohazard are brought to the university so Cecile can run some tests on the crabs that were sent from Morocco. They have the same weird white substance inside their bodies, and when she tests it with human blood, the same infection starts feeding on it. This means it isn't just the water, the seafood isn't safe for consumption either. Afterwards Cecile and Sophia discuss that the shell color indicates these are the vent crabs, which usually can't survive on land. They're either a mutation or a new species. Meanwhile Charlie returns to Scotland and discovers she has a message from Jess recorded right before she drowned. To deal with her grief, she watches it a couple of times, only to discover the white substance appearing on the window. She also notices there's a weird noise in the recording and when she compares it to the footage from the underwater camera, she confirms they're the same. She immediately calls Raheem and asks him to share this with Lehman. At the same time, Sigur tries contacting Tina on her work phone since she won't pick up her personal number, only to learn she doesn't work at Hubbardstadt anymore. Afterward he goes to see Lehman, who tells him of a slide in Japan caused by the ice worms. This slide was small, but it could be an alert of bigger disasters happening, and Sigur points out the worms are only appearing in areas where they can do the most damage to mankind. Lehman thinks that's crazy, but Raheem takes the chance to tell her about Charlie's discovery. However even after hearing Charlie out and seeing the matching wavelengths, Lehman still thinks it's just the same glitch on the calm signal and not a sign of anything. Charlie insists she's onto something and shows that before all the ships sunk, there was a spike in water temperature above a vent that is supposed to be dormant. Lehman refuses to believe there's a force on earth that could take the water from the vent to the ship and yells at Charlie, forbidding her from going down there to investigate. Sometime later, Sigur learns that the International Council for the Protection of the Ocean has called for an urgent meeting in Switzerland. He calls Sato to explain he wants to go to see the council because he has a theory that all these incidents are probably connected, and in return Sato gives him Leon's number so they can compare notes, promising to get him a place in the big meeting. After calling Leon to share the information they have, Sigur goes home and is surprised to find Tina inside. He tries apologizing for not trusting her but Tina just says she's tired of lying bosses and announces that she is going away alone. Hurt, Sigur tells her that he can't imagine life without her, but Tina only responds goodbye before leaving. Later, Sigur checks out Leon's footage and realizes that the noise is the same as the one Charlie identified. He quickly sends it to the Institute and this is enough proof to send a Deepwater O for further testing. Lehman also authorizes Sigur to go along. While Sigur brings the Ove and Leon's footage to Charlie, everyone in the Institute gets a warning about a tsunami forming near the coasts of Norway, Denmark, and Scotland. Raheem tries to contact Charlie, but she left the phone behind while saying goodbye to Sigur, who is now taking off in a helicopter. At the same time that Douglas is arriving to visit Charlie, Lehman manages to get in contact with Sigur, who immediately tells the pilot to wait. He runs to warn Charlie, who wants to go after Douglas to save him too, but there isn't enough time, 
Sigur drags her into the helicopter and it flies off, so Charlie has to watch her boyfriend die and her home get destroyed. In the meantime, Tina goes to see her boyfriend to break up with him. She's near the beach when she suddenly sees a bunch of birds flying by and the water begins to form a giant wave right in front of her. Everyone in the area begins running away and Tina tries to get help from her boyfriend, who escapes in his car alone even though he did see her. Knowing there's no hope, Tina gets in her own car and leaves a message for Sigur, saying I cannot imagine my life without you either right before the wave kills her too. All news outlets over the world cover this disaster, which caused thousands of deaths. Charlie leaves Scotland and Raheem tries to take care of her while Sigur goes home and finds Tina's message, which causes him to have a breakdown as he plays it on repeat. Soon Cecile holds a press conference, attended by Samantha, Alicia, and Sada while the others watch it on TV. She shares everything she's discovered about the crabs and how she believes it's connected to all the weird things happening, even saying the deaths caused by the tsunami could have been prevented. After the conference is over, Sigur calls Sato to ask for a meeting with both Cecile and Leon. In the evening, Cecile and Sigur meet through a video call and discuss the possibility of all these events being strategically planned. Cecile even theorizes that whoever is doing this is learning from previous events because the infected lobsters were fished but the crabs came to town themselves. The next day, Sigur meets with Leon, Charlie, Cecile, and Raheem at the institute and they try to convince Lehman of their theory. They think there's a mysterious sentient being that is coordinating all the animals to cause these attacks to get back at humanity for how they've ruined the planet. However Lehman refuses to believe it, saying this goes against all the foundations of science, so she won't endorse Sigur's presentation for the council. Afterward, Sigur informs Sato that Lehman isn't coming, but Sato isn't worried because he thinks they have enough proof. Raheem and Cecile chat for a while and think that this being's actions are defensive, not aggressive. Later in the evening, Sigur notices Leon's bracelet and hears a story about the symbol on it, which his mother gave him for his curiosity because it means unknown. Sigur likes the symbol and draws it on paper, inspiring him to call the mysterious being Ur. The following day, the team brings their presentation to the council, explaining they want funding to make contact with Ur and ask it to stop. Unfortunately the council thinks the idea of nature attacking humans for revenge is ridiculous. They don't consider there's enough proof and are suspicious of the fact the team has connections to Mifune Industries and Hubestad but no support from any of the actual science organizations they work for. After the disappointing meeting, Alicia brings Samansa to meet the team with some big news. This weird signal they've found near the beaches has also been picked up in Antarctica and the Arctic Ocean. Samantha agrees with the team's theory and wants to join them. Meanwhile Sato and Sigur have a chat with Mifune, who approves of the theory too and has decided to fund the project. Afterward Sigur tells the details of the mission to the rest of the team, explaining it's very dangerous so he won't judge anyone that wants to quit now. Charlie has no relatives so it's easy for her to accept, but Raheem informs her he won't join the project because he's worked enough so now he wants to spend time with his family. Charlie can't help feeling betrayed. The rest of the team does accept to go, but they visit their families before leaving. Cecile doesn't tell her children of the danger, but in private, she arranges all the paperwork with her ex-husband in case something happens. Sigur spends his evening hearing Tina's message until he's finally capable of deleting it. Soon the team leaves on Jasper's ship and by analyzing all their information, they calculate her must be somewhere in the Mali Deep located in the Arctic Ocean. They contact Mifune to inform him of their plans, and he makes sure they'll keep both video and written logs of everything. Jasper teaches them about all the security cameras the ship has, but Alicia still goes around interviewing everyone for her own video logs. The scientists still run tests to keep their intel up to date and Charlie works on maintenance for the submarine with crew member Luther. After traveling for a while, the ship's equipment starts flickering with interference and the scientists manage to capture a signal. Samantha immediately begins designing a message to send back by using Earth's signal with slight modifications. She adds a slight spike and the sound of a baby's cry to indicate they want to communicate. If Earth returns a message with the same spike, they'll confirm its intelligence. Meanwhile Cecile and Seguar confirm that the white substance controls the animals by inserting itself into their nervous system, as if forming an army that follows its orders. Later Jasper stops the ship and while they transmit Samantha's message, Charlie and Luther take the submarine for a test drive. After just a few seconds, the radar detects something big in the water, but the duo can't see anything. In the ship, their sensors also detect this mysterious mass and pick up another signal before the computers start flickering again and they notice the mass is coming closer. At that moment, Luther notices they've lost their fans and are running out of air, so he has to switch to backup. He tries to inform the ship of this, but they've lost communications too. Worried, Luther wants to abort the mission, but Charlie asks him to turn off the lights because she thinks there's something out there. Jasper and Sigur try to tell them to come back but their messages won't go through, making Samantha and Leon realize that although they stopped broadcasting, the signal is still coming in. The situation in the submarine is too tense and Luther decides they're going back. As the submarine makes its way back into the ship, Charlie notices the glowing white substance floating in the water. Afterward, Samantha reports that they've made contact with her because it sent back their signal with an alteration to the baby's cry, meaning it understood what they did and replied in kind. 
By assembling the wavelengths of the message they received, she can create an image that she can send as a new message. Meanwhile Alicia is checking out the submarine when she suddenly notices a glow in the hangar pool. The ship lights start flickering until they go completely out, only to come back in a few seconds. To the crew's horror, they see on the cameras that Alicia is unconscious and bleeding on the hangar floor. Cecile immediately rushes her to the medical bay and finds cerebral fluid in her nose, meaning she fell and hit her head pretty hard. It'll be hard to keep her alive. Later Samantha tells the team that during the voltage, there was a blast of sound that emanated from inside the ship. While Jasper orders his whole crew to double-check their equipment to make sure the signal isn't a machine malfunctioning, Leon visits Alicia and notices her body is covered in strange spots. Cecile says they aren't blood clots, so she asks the others to hold Alicia down while she does a lumbar puncture. After running some tests on the spinal fluid, Cecile confirms that Alicia is infected with the same white substance the ur injected in the animals and is trying to fuse with her cells. At that moment Charlie admits she saw some glowing in the water, and theorizes it followed them back inside. The hangar is immediately secured and samples are taken for testing. Then Sato calls Mifune to tell him about the accident and Mifune informs them that the crabs are now appearing in the Adriatic region too. In the meantime, Samansa finishes designing the message and makes the wavelengths look like the graphic of evolution because she wants the Ur to know that humans also come from the ocean. The message is sent and now the team will take turns waiting in front of the computer for an answer. While Charlie watches the pool from the window, she suddenly notices the water starts glowing, creating all kinds of beautiful shapes with the light. At the same time, the computer picks up a response from Ur that also creates an image. Moments later, Mifune arrives by helicopter and the team shows him the recording of the lights in the pool as Sigur explains it's a single-cell organism that can fuse into a larger multicellular mass capable of taking shapes. Next Samantha shows the image from the message, which represents the super-oceans surrounding the supercontinent that existed 250 million years ago when Earth's continents were joined. This means the Ur has a collective memory that passes from generation to generation through their DNA. The Ur probably sent a message to tell people that they've been here since the beginning and won't let humans destroy the environment, but Sigur thinks the responses are a sign the Ur is willing to talk. When Cecile informs the team Alicia is stable, Charlie shares a theory. She thinks that the Ur wasn't trying to kill Alicia when they entered her, it was actually trying to find out about the crew. It was the first time they tried to send a message back, so the Ur probably wanted to confirm humans were intelligent. Then Leon uses some whale sounds to make a new message and let the Ur know that humans have helped animals as well. In a private room, Mifune brings Jasper some bad news, another tsunami has destroyed most of Nigeria. During the following hours, Cecile continues to run tests and finally devises a medicine capable of destroying the infection that consumes the blood cells. Mifune wants to test it on the actual Ur and Sigur immediately protests, saying killing the Ur would cause irreparable damage to life in the ocean and that they're supposed to be negotiating. If the ocean dies, so will humans. An argument ensues since the team feels divided on the issue, in the end they agree to test it only in the pool so they can later negotiate with a backup for their safety. Cecile and Luther suit up and go to the pool to drop the medicine in the water, which causes an instant effect. The lights flicker as the Ur raises in a solid wave and screams before dying in a small explosion that breaks all the windows, makes the ship lose all power, and knocks the duo out. Cecile quickly wakes up and drags Luther inside to do CPR, but it's too late, he's already dead. All propulsion is gone too so now the ship is just drifting, and in just a few seconds it hits a big iceberg. Suddenly the ship begins moving back and they realize the Ur under them, moving the ship as it pleases. Samantha guesses that the scream from the pool must have sent a message to the ocean. The ship won't stay afloat for long though, so Jasper wants to know why they aren't killing the whole Ur. Sigur points out they got terrible consequences for just killing a small part of it, so killing it all would only make it worse. Their only solution is to try to negotiate, and Sigur makes a plan, they should inject Luther with the white substance and Charlie can use the submarine to take the body in the most concentrated area of Ur as a message of complete obedience. Suddenly the ship shakes and they discover the Ur has pushed them against another iceberg. They need to start evacuating soon, so Sigur tells Cecile to leave with Alicia and Mifune's helicopter. As everyone rushes to get everything for the plan ready, the Ur brings more icebergs to surround the ship and trap it. Once Luther's body is in the submarine, Charlie dives in. For a while she sees nothing but darkness, but eventually she finds the glowing substance at the same time the ship picks up more wavelengths. Now she's deep enough, Charlie makes a difficult decision. Luther is too far gone, so to make the message valid, Charlie will use her own body instead. People on the ship cry for her as Charlie proceeds to inject herself and lets the water enter the submarine. Soon the Ur shows up and takes Charlie out of the submarine to slowly enter her body. This releases its power from the icebergs and the ship is free to sail again. Sometime later, Charlie's body appears on a beach. She's alive and when she opens her eyes, they're glowing blue.